This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. Mysticism A Study in Nature and Development of Spiritual Consciousness by Evelyn Underhill. Second Half of Part One, Chapter Three. It is clear that under ordinary conditions, and save for sudden gusts of transcendental feeling induced by some saving madness such as religion, art, or love, the superficial self knows nothing of the attitude of this silent watcher, this dweller in the innermost, towards the incoming messages of the external world, nor of the activities which they awake in it. Concentrated on the sense world and the messages she receives from it, she knows nothing of the relations which exist between this subject and the unattainable object of all thought. But by a deliberate inattention to the messages of the senses, such as that which is induced by contemplation, the mystic can bring the ground of the soul, the seat of transcendental feeling, within the area of consciousness, making it amenable to the activity of the will. Thus becoming unaware of his usual and largely fictitious external world, another and more substantial set of perceptions, which never have their chance under normal conditions, rise to the surface. Sometimes these unite with normal reasoning faculties. More often they supersede them. Some such exchange, such losing to find, appears to be necessary if man's transcendental powers are to have their full chance. The two eyes of the soul of man, says the theologia Germanica, here developing a profound platonic image, cannot both perform their work at once. But if the soul shall see with the right eye into eternity, then the left eye must close itself and refrain from working, and be as though it were dead. For if the left eye be fulfilling its office toward outward things, that is, holding converse with time and the creatures, then must the right eye be hindered in its working, that is, in its contemplation. Therefore, whosoever will have the one must let the other go, for no man can serve two masters. There is within us an immense capacity for perception, for the receiving of messages from outside, and a very little consciousness which deals with them. It is as if one telegraph operator were placed in charge of a multitude of lines. All may be in action, but he can only attend to one at a time. In popular language, there is not enough consciousness to go round. Even upon the sensual plane, no one can be aware of more than a few things at once. These fill the center of our field of consciousness, as the object on which we happen to have focused our vision dominates our field of sight. The other matters within that field retreat to the margin. We know dimly that they are there, but we pay them no attention, and should hardly miss them if they cease to exist. Transcendental matters are, for most of us, always beyond the margin, because most of us have given up our whole consciousness to the occupation of the senses, and permitted them to construct there a universe in which we are contented to remain. Only in certain states... Recollection, contemplation, ecstasy and their allied conditions. Does the self contrive to turn out the usual tenants, shut the gateways of the flesh, and let those submerged powers which are capable of picking up messages from another plane of being have their turn? Then it is the sense world which retreats beyond the margin, and another landscape that rushes in. At last, then, we begin to see something of what contemplation does for its initiates. It is one of the many names applied to that chain of processes which have for their object this alteration of the mental equilibrium, the putting to sleep of that normal self which usually wakes, and the awakening of that transcendental self which usually sleeps. To man, meeting point of various stages of reality, is given, though he seldom considers it, this unique power of choosing his universe. The phenomenon known as double or disintegrated personality 
may perhaps give us a hint as to the mechanical nature of the change which contemplation effects. In this psychic malady, the total character of the patient is split up. A certain group of qualities are, as it were, abstracted from the surface consciousness, and so closely associated as to form in themselves a complete character or personality, necessarily poles asunder from the character which the self usually shows to the world, since it consists exclusively of those elements which are omitted from it. Thus, in the classical case of Miss Beauchamp, the investigator, Dr. Morton Prince, called the three chief personalities, from their ruling characteristics, the saint, the woman, and the devil. The totality of character which composed the real Miss Beauchamp had split up into these contrasting types, each of which was excessive, because withdrawn from the control of the rest. When, voluntarily or involuntarily, the personality which had possession of the field of consciousness was lulled to sleep, one of the others emerged. Hypnotism was one of the means which most easily effected this change. Now in persons of mystical genius, the qualities which the stress of normal life tends to keep below the threshold of consciousness are of enormous strength. In these natural explorers of eternity, the transcendental faculty, the eye of the soul, is not merely present in embryo, but is highly developed, and is combined with great emotional and volitional power. The result of the segregation of such qualities below the threshold of consciousness is to remove from them the friction of those counterbalancing traits in the surface mind with which they might collide. They are in the hiddenness, as Jacob Bowen would say. There they develop unchecked, until a point is reached at which their strength is such that they break their bounds and emerge into the conscious field, either temporarily dominating the subject as in ecstasy, or permanently transmuting the old self as in the unitive life. The attainment of this point may be accelerated by processes which have always been known and valued by the mystics, and which tend to produce a state of consciousness classed by psychologists with dreams, reverie, and the results of hypnosis. In all these, the normal surface consciousness is deliberately or involuntarily lulled. The images and ideas connected with normal life are excluded, and images or faculties from beyond the threshold are able to take their place. Of course, these images or faculties may or may not be more valuable than those already present in the surface consciousness. In the ordinary subject, often enough, they are but the odds and ends for which the superficial mind has found no use. In the mystic, they are of a very different order, and this fact justifies the means which he instinctively employs to secure their emergence. Indian mysticism founds its external system almost wholly on a. ascetism, the domination of the senses, and b. the deliberate practice of self-hypnotization, either by fixing the eyes on a near object, or by the rhythmic repetition of the mantra or sacred word. By these complementary forms of discipline, the pull of the phenomenal world is diminished, and the mind is placed at the disposal of the subconscious powers. Dancing, music, and other exaggerations of natural rhythm have been pressed into the same service by the Greek initiates of Dionysus, by the Gnostics, by innumerable other mystic cults. That these proceedings do effect a remarkable change in the human consciousness is proved by experience though how and why they do it is as yet little understood. Such artificial and deliberate production of ecstasy is against the whole instinct of the Christian contemplatives. But here and there amongst them also we find instances in which ecstatic trance or lucidity, the liberation of the transcendental sense, was inadvertently produced by purely physical means. Thus Jacob Boeb, the Teutonic theosopher, having one day as he sat in his room, gazed fixedly upon a burnished pewter dish which reflected the sunshine with great brilliance, fell into an inward ecstasy, and it seemed to him as if he could look into the principles and deepest foundations of things. The contemplation of running water had the same effect on St. Ignatius Loyola. 
sitting on the bank of a river one day and facing the stream, which was running deep, the eyes of his mind were opened, not so as to see any kind of vision, but so as to understand and comprehend spiritual things, and this with such clearness that for him all these things were made new. This method of attaining to mental lucidity by a narrowing and simplification of the conscious field finds an apt parallel in the practice of Immanuel Kant, who found that he could better engage in philosophical thought while gazing steadily at a neighbouring church steeple. It need hardly be said that rationalistic writers, ignoring the parallels offered by the artistic and philosophic temperaments, have seized eagerly upon the evidence afforded by such instances of apparent monoideism and self hypnotization in the lives of the mystics, and by the physical disturbances which accompany the ecstatic trance, and sought by its application to attribute all the abnormal perceptions of contemplative genius to hysteria or other disease. They have not hesitated to call St. Paul an epileptic, St. Teresa the patron saint of hysterics, and have found room for most of their spiritual kindred in various departments of the pathological museum. They have been helped in this grateful task by the acknowledged fact that the great contemplatives, though almost always persons of robust intelligence and marked practical or intellectual ability, Plotinus, St. Bernard, the two saints Catherine, St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, and the Sufi poets Jamie and Jalaluddin are cases in point, have often suffered from bad physical health. More, their mystical activities have generally reacted upon their bodies in a definite and special way, producing in several cases a particular kind of illness and of physical disability, accompanied by pains and functional disturbances for which no organic cause could be discovered, unless that cause were the immense strain which exalted spirit puts upon a body which is adapted to a very different form of life. It is certain that the abnormal and highly sensitized type of mind, which we call mystical, does frequently, but not always, produce or accompany strange and inexplicable modifications of the physical organism with which it is linked. The supernatural is not here in question, except in so far as we are inclined to give that name to natural phenomena which we do not understand. Such instances of psychophysical parallelism as the stigmatizations of the saints, and indeed of other suggestible subjects hardly to be ranked as saints, will occur to any one. I here offer to the reader another less discussed and more extraordinary example of the modifying influence of the spirit on the supposed laws of bodily life. We know as a historical fact, unusually well attested by contemporary evidence and quite outside the sphere of hagiographic romance, that both St. Catherine of Siena and her namesake, St. Catherine of Genoa, active women as well as ecstatics, the first a philanthropist, reformer, and politician, the second an original theologian, and for many years the highly efficient matron of a large hospital, lived, in the first case, for years, in the second, for constantly repeated periods of many weeks, without other food than the consecrated host which they received at Holy Communion. They did this not by way of difficult obedience to a pious vow, but because they could not live in any other way. Whilst fasting, they were well and active, capable of dealing with the innumerable responsibilities which filled their lives. But the attempt to eat even a few mouthfuls, and this attempt was constantly repeated, for, like all true saints, they detested eccentricity, at once made them ill and had to be abandoned as useless. In spite of the researches of Mauricia, Janet, Ribot, and other psychologists, and their persevering attempts to find a pathological explanation which will fit all mystic facts, this and other marked physical peculiarities which accompany the mystical temperament belong as yet to the unsolved problems of humanity. They need to be removed both from the sphere of marvel and from that of disease, into which enthusiastic friends and foes force them by turn to the sphere of pure psychology, and there study dispassionately, with the attention which we so willingly bestow on the less interesting eccentricities of degeneracy and vice. 
Their existence no more discredits the sanity of mysticism or the validity of its results than the unstable nervous condition usually noticed in artists, who share to some extent the mystic's apprehension of the real, discredits art. In such cases as Kant and Beethoven, says von Hugel justly, a classifier of humanity according to its psychophysical phenomena alone would put these great discoverers and creators, without hesitation, amongst hopeless and useless hypochondriacs. In the case of the mystics, the disease of hysteria, with its astounding variety of mental symptoms, its strange power of disintegrating, rearranging and enhancing the elements of consciousness, its tendencies to automatism and ecstasy, have been most often invoked to provide an explanation of the observed phenomena. This is as if one sought the source of the genius of Taglioni in the symptoms of St. Vitus's dance. Both the art and the disease have to do with bodily movements. So too both mysticism and hysteria have to do with the domination of consciousness by one fixed and intense idea or intuition, which rules the life and is able to produce amazing physical and psychical results. In the hysteric patient, this idea is often trivial or morbid, but has become, thanks to the self's unstable mental condition, an obsession. In the mystic, the dominant idea is a great one, so great, in fact, that when it is received in its completeness by the human consciousness, almost of necessity it outs all else. It is nothing less than the idea or perception of the transcendent reality and presence of God. Hence the monoideism of the mystic is rational, whilst that of the hysteric patient is invariably irrational. On the whole, then, whilst psychophysical relations remain so little understood, it would seem more prudent, and certainly more scientific, to withhold our judgment on the meaning of the psychophysical phenomena which accompany the mystic life, instead of basing destructive criticism on facts which are avowedly mysterious and at least capable of more than one interpretation. To deduce the nature of a compound from the character of its by-products is notoriously unsafe. Our bodies are animal things, made for animal activities. When a spirit of unusual ardour insists on using its nerve cells for other activities, they kick against the pricks, and inflict, as the mystics themselves acknowledge, the penalty of mystical ill health. Believe me, children, says Tola, one who would know much about these high matters would often have to keep his bed, for his bodily frame could not support it. I cause the extreme pain of body, says the voice of love to MacThield of Magdeburg. If I gave myself to thee as often as thou wouldst have me, I should deprive myself of the sweet shelter I have of thee in this world, for a thousand bodies could not protect a loving soul from her desire. Therefore the higher the love, the greater the pain. On the other hand, the exalted personality of the mystic, his self-discipline, his heroic acceptance of labour and suffering, and his inflexible will, raises to a higher term that normal power of mind over body which all possess. Also, the contemplative state, like the hypnotic state in a healthy person, seems to enhance life by throwing open deeper levels of personality. The self then drinks at a fountain which is fed by the universal life. True ecstasy is notoriously life-enhancing. In it, a bracing contact with reality seems to take place, and as a result the subject is himself more real. Often, says St. Teresa, even the sick come forth from ecstasy, healthy, and with new strength, for something great is then given to the soul. Contact has been set up with levels of being which the daily routine of existence leaves untouched. Hence the extraordinary powers of endurance, and independence of external conditions, which the great ecstatics so often display. If we see in the mystics, as some have done, the sporadic beginning of a power, a higher consciousness, towards which the race slowly tends, then it seems likely enough that where it appears, nerves and organs should suffer under a stress to which they have not yet become adapted, 
and that a spirit more highly organized than its bodily home should be able to impose strange conditions on the flesh. When man first stood upright, a body long accustomed to go on all fours, legs which had adjusted themselves to bearing but half his weight, must have rebelled against this unnatural proceeding, inflicting upon its author much pain and discomfort, if not absolute illness. It is at least permissible to look upon the strange psychophysical state common amongst the mystics as just such a rebellion on the part of a normal nervous and vascular system against the exigencies of a way of life to which it has not yet adjusted itself. In spite of such rebellion, and of the tortures to which it has subjected them, the mystics, oddly enough, are a long-lived race, an awkward fact for critics of the physiological school. To take only a few instances from amongst marked ecstatics, St. Hildegard lived to be 81, Mechthild of Magdeburg to 87, Rusburg to 88, Suso to 70, St. Teresa to 67, St. Catherine of Genoa, and St. Peter of Alcantara to 63. It seems as though that enhanced life, which is the reward of mystical surrender, enabled them to triumph over their bodily disabilities and to live and do the work demanded of them under conditions which would have incapacitated ordinary men. Such triumphs, which take heroic rank in the history of the human mind, have been accomplished as a rule in the same way. Like all intuitive persons, all possessors of genius, all potential artists, with whom in fact they are closely related, the mystics have, in psychological language, thresholds of exceptional mobility. That is to say, a slight effort, a slight departure from normal conditions, will permit their latent or subliminal powers to emerge and occupy the mental field. A mobile threshold may make a man a genius, a lunatic, or a saint. All depends upon the character of the emerging powers. In the great mystic, these powers these tracks of personality lying below the level of normal consciousness are of unusual richness and cannot be accounted for in terms of pathology. If it be true, says Delacroix, that the great mystics have not wholly escaped those nervous blemishes which mark nearly all exceptional organizations, there is in them a vital and creative power, a constructive logic, an extended scale of realization, in a word, a genius which is, in truth, their essential quality. The great mystics, creators and inventors, who have found a new form of life and have justified it, join, upon the highest summits of the human spirit, the great simplifiers of the world. The truth, then, so far as we know it at present, seems to be that those powers which are in contact with the transcendental order, and which constitute at the lowest estimate half the self, are dormant in ordinary men, whose time and interest are wholly occupied in responding to the stimuli of the world of sense. With those latent powers sleeps the landscape which they alone can apprehend. In mystics, none of the self is always dormant. They have roused the dweller in the innermost from its slumbers, and round it have unified their life. Heart, reason, will are there in full action, drawing their incentive not from the shadow-show of sense, but from the deeps of true being, where a lamp is lit, and a consciousness awake, of which the sleepy crowd remains oblivious. He who says the mystic is but half a man, states the exact opposite of the truth. Only the mystic can be called a whole man, since in others half the powers of the self always sleep. This wholeness of experience is much insisted on by the mystics. Thus the divine voice says to St. Catherine of Siena, I have also shown thee the bridge and the three general steps placed there for the three powers of the soul. And I have told thee how no one can attain to the life of grace unless he has mounted all three steps. That is, gathered together all the three powers of the soul in my name. In those abnormal types of personality to which we give the name of genius, we seem to detect a hint of the relations which may exist between these deep levels of being 
and the crust of consciousness. In the poet, the musician, the great mathematician or inventor, powers lying below the threshold, and hardly controllable by their owner's conscious will, clearly take a major part in the business of perception and conception. In all creative acts, the larger share of the work is done subconsciously. Its emergence is in a sense automatic. This is equally true of mystics, artists, philosophers, discoverers, and rulers of men. The great religion, invention, work of art, always owes its inception to some sudden uprush of intuitions or ideas for which the superficial self cannot account. It's execution to powers so far beyond the control of that self that they seem, as their owner sometimes says, to come from beyond. This is inspiration, the opening of the sluices, so that those waters of truth in which all life is bathed may rise to the level of consciousness. The great teacher, poet, artist, inventor, never aims deliberately at his effects. He obtains that he knows not how, perhaps from a contact of which he is unconscious, with that creative plane of being which the Sufis call the constructive spirit, and the Kabbalists, Yisod, and which both postulate as lying next behind the world of sense. Sometimes, said the great Alexandrian Jew Philo, when I have come to my work empty, I have suddenly become full. Ideas being in an invisible manner showered upon me, and implanted in me from on high, so that through the influence of divine inspiration, I have become greatly excited, and have known neither the place in which I was, nor those who were present, nor myself, nor what I was saying, nor what I was writing. For then I have been conscious of a richness of interpretation, an enjoyment of life, a most penetrating insight, a most manifest energy in all that was to be done, having such an effect on my mind as the clearest ocular demonstration would have on the eyes. This is a true creative ecstasy, strictly parallel to the state in which the mystic performs his mighty works. To let oneself go, be quiet, receptive, appears to be the condition under which such contact with the cosmic life may be obtained. I have noticed that when one paints one should think of nothing. Everything then comes better, says the young Raphael to Leonardo da Vinci. The superficial self must here acknowledge its own insufficiency, must become the humble servant of a more profound and vital consciousness. The mystics are of the same opinion. Let the will quietly and wisely understand, says St. Teresa, that it is not by dint of labor on our part that we can converse to any good purpose with God. The best and noblest way in which thou mayst come into this life, says Eckhart, is by keeping silence and letting God work and speak. Where all the powers are withdrawn from their work and images, there is this word spoken. The more thou canst draw in all thy powers, and forget the creature, the nearer art thou to this, and the more receptive. Thus Boehm says to the neophyte, When both thy intellect and will are quiet and passive to the expressions of the eternal word and spirit, and when thy soul is winged up above that which is temporal, the outward senses and the imagination being locked up by holy abstraction, then the eternal hearing, seeing, and speaking will be revealed in thee. Blessed art thou, therefore, if thou canst stand still from self-thinking and self-willing, and canst stop the wheel of thy imagination and senses. Then, the conscious mind being passive, the more divine mind below the threshold, organ of our free creative life, can emerge and present its reports. In the words of an older mystic, the soul leaving all things and forgetting herself, is immersed in the ocean of divine splendor and illuminated by the sublime abyss of the unfathomable wisdom. The passivity of contemplation, then, is a necessary preliminary of spiritual energy, an essential clearing of the ground. It withdraws the tide of consciousness from the shores of sense, stops the wheel of the imagination. 
The soul, says Eckhart again, is created in a place between time and eternity. With its highest powers, it touches eternity. With its lower, time. These, the worlds of being and becoming, are the two stages of reality, which meet in the spirit of man. By cutting us off from the temporal plane, the lower kind of reality, contemplation gives the eternal plane, and the powers which can communicate with that plane, their chance. In the born mystic these powers are great, and lie very near the normal threshold of consciousness. He has a genius for transcendental, or as he would say, divine, discovery in much the same way as his cousins, the born musician and poet, have a genius for musical or poetic discovery. In all three cases, the emergence of these higher powers is mysterious, and not least so to those who experience it. Psychology on the one hand, theology on the other, may offer us diagrams and theories of this proceeding, of the strange oscillations of the developing consciousness, the fitful visitations of a lucidity and creative power over which the self has little or no control. The raptures and griefs of a vision by turns granted and withdrawn. But the secret of genius still eludes us, as the secret of life eludes the biologist. The utmost we can say of such persons is that reality presents itself to them under abnormal conditions and in abnormal terms, and that subject to these conditions and in these terms they are bound to deal with it. Thanks to their peculiar mental makeup, one aspect of the universe is for them focused so sharply that in comparison with it all other images are blurred, vague and unreal. Hence the sacrifice which men of genius, mystics, artists, inventors, make of their whole lives to this one object, this one vision of truth, is not self-denial but rather self-fulfillment. They gather themselves up from the unreal in order to concentrate on the real. The whole personality then absorbs or enters into communion with certain rhythms or harmonies existent in the universe, which the receiving apparatus of other selves cannot take up. Here is the finger of God, a flash of the will that can, exclaims Abt Vogler, as the sounds grow under his hand. The numbers came, says the poet. He knows not how, certainly not by deliberate intellection. So it is with the mystic. Madame Guyon states in her autobiography that when she was composing her works, she would experience a sudden and irresistible inclination to take up her pen, though feeling wholly incapable of literary composition, and not even knowing the subject on which she would be impelled to write. If she resisted this impulse, it was at the cost of the most intense discomfort. She would then begin to write with extraordinary swiftness, words, elaborate arguments, and appropriate quotations coming to her without reflection, and so quickly that one of her longest books was written in one and a half days. In writing, I saw that I was writing of things which I had never seen, and during the time of this manifestation, I was given light to perceive that I had in me treasures of knowledge and understanding which I did not know that I possessed. Similar statements are made of St. Teresa, who declared that in writing her books she was powerless to set down anything but that which her master put into her mind. So Blake said of Milton and Jerusalem, I have written the poems from immediate dictation, twelve or sometimes twenty or thirty lines at a time, without premeditation and even against my will. The time it has taken in writing was thus rendered non-existent, and an immense poem exists which seems to be the labour of a long life, all produced without labour or study. These are, of course, extreme forms of that strange power of automatic composition, in which words and characters arrive and arrange themselves in defiance of their author's will, of which most poets and novelists possess a trace. Such composition is probably related to the automatic writing of mediums and other sensitives, in which the often disorderly and incoherent subliminal mind seizes upon this channel of expression. The subliminal mind of the great mystic, however, is not disorderly. 
It is abnormally sensitive, richly endowed and keenly observant, a treasure house, not a lumber room, and becomes in the course of its education a highly disciplined and skilled instrument of knowledge. When, therefore, its contents emerge and are presented to the normal consciousness in the form of lucidity, auditions, visions, automatic writing, or any other translations of the supersensible into the terms of sensible perception, they cannot be discredited because the worthless unconscious region of feebler nature sometimes manifests itself in the same way. Idiots are often voluble, but many orators are sane. Now, to sum up, what are the chief characteristics which we have found to concern us in this sketch map of the mental life of man? 1. We have divided that life, arbitrarily enough, along the fluctuating line which psychologists call the threshold of his consciousness, into the surface life and the unconscious deeps. 2. In the surface life, though we recognize its essential wholeness, we distinguish three outstanding and ever-present aspects, the trinity and unity of feeling, thought, and will. Amongst these, we were obliged to give the primacy to feeling as the power which set the machinery of thought and will to work. 3. We have seen that the expression of this life takes the two complementary forms of conation, or outgoing action, and cognition, or indwelling knowledge, and that the first, which is dynamic in type, is largely the work of the will stimulated by the emotions, whilst the second, which is passive in type, is the business of the intellect. They answer to the two main aspects which man discerns in the universal life, being and becoming. 4. Neither conation nor cognition, action nor thought, as performed by this surface mind, concerned as it is with natural existence and dominated by spatial conceptions, is able to set up any relations with the absolute or transcendental world. Such action and thought deal wholly with material supplied directly or indirectly by the world of sense. The testimony of the mystics, however, and of all persons possessing an instinct for the absolute, points to the existence of a further faculty, indeed a deeper self, in man, a self which the circumstances of diurnal life usually keep below the threshold of his consciousness, and which thus becomes one of the factors of his subliminal life. This hidden self is the primary agent of mysticism, and lives a substantial life in touch with the real or transcendental world. 5. Certain processes, of which contemplation has been taken as a type, can so alter the state of consciousness as to permit the emergence of this deeper self, which, according as it enters more or less into the conscious of life, makes man more or less a mystic. The mystic life, therefore, involves the emergence from deep levels of man's transcendental self, its capture of the field of consciousness, and the conversion or rearrangement of his feeling, thought and will, his character, about this new centre of life. We state, then, as the conclusion of this chapter, that the object of the mystic's adventure, seen from within, is the apprehension of, or direct communion with, that transcendental reality which we tried in the last section to define from without. Here, as in the fulfilment of the highest earthly love, knowledge and communion are the same thing. We must be one with bliss if we are to be aware of it. That aspect of our being by which we may attain this communion, that marrow of the soul, as Rusborek calls it, usually lies below the threshold of our consciousness. But in certain natures of abnormal richness and vitality, and under certain favourable conditions, it may be liberated by various devices, such as contemplation. Once it has emerged, however, it takes up, to help it in the work, aspects of the conscious self. The surface must cooperate with the deeps, and at last merge with those deeps to produce that unification of consciousness upon high levels which alone can put a term to man's unrest. The heart that longs for the all, the mind that conceives it, the will that concentrates the whole self upon it, must all be called into play. The self must be surrendered, but it must not be annihilated, 
as some quietists have supposed. It only dies that it may live again. Supreme success, the permanent assurance of the mystic that we are more verily in heaven than in earth, says the Lady Julian, in a passage which anticipates the classification of modern psychology, cometh of the natural love of our soul, and of the clear light of our reason, and of the steadfast mind. But what is the order of precedence which these three activities are to assume in the work which is one? All, as we have seen, must do their part, for we are concerned with the response of man in his wholeness to the overwhelming attraction of God. But which shall predominate? The ultimate nature of the self's experience of reality will depend on the answer she gives to this question. What, here, are the relative values of mind and heart? Which will bring her closest to the thought of God, the real life in which she is bathed? Which, fostered and made dominant, is most likely to put her in harmony with the absolute? The love of God, which is ever in the heart and often on the lips of the saints, is the passionate desire for this harmony. The malady of thought is its intellectual equivalent. Though we may seem to escape God, we cannot escape some form of this craving, except at the price of utter stagnation. We go back, therefore, to the statement with which this chapter opened, that of the two governing desires which share the prison of the self, we see them now as representing the cravings of the intellect and the emotions for the only end of all quests. The disciplined will, the cognitive power, with all the dormant faculties which it can wake and utilize, can come to the assistance of one of them. Which? The question is a crucial one, for the destiny of the self depends on the partner which the will selects. End of Part 1, Chapter 3